My name is Neil Stolzmark, and I study Okinawan Shornru under the Shorenkan Association. I have a rank of 8th Dan in Shorenru Shorenkan from Shiguro's Nakazato Sensei, and I also study Okinawa Kobro in the Mate Oyoshi lineage, and I have recently received my 9th Dan in Okinawa Kobro. Well, my junior year of high school, I became interested in karate and I was lucky enough that there was a Okinawan karate dojo in my town of Waukesha, Wisconsin. And I went there actually after a football injury and enrolled. Uh, the name of the place was Yamashita Karate Studio, uh, named after a very f famous movie actor and martial artist from, from Okinawa. And the owner of the studio, his name was Dan Schrader. Uh, Dan is actually uh, Sensei Yamashita's most senior student. So the first five years uh, when I was studying with uh, Sensei Dan Schrader, I started doing competition um, just before uh, the rank of brown belt. And when I made black belt, when I had a pretty heavy, you know, usually two weekends a month uh, to like uh, point karate tournaments. And uh, with the help of, uh, you know, my Sensei Dan Schrader, uh, we used to spar and um, uh, you know the, the philosophies he taught me originally were were uh, distance distance and timing and of course I I was also training with Sensei Yamashita and he would get you know lots of, of great ideas and and very effective techniques and and things like that so uh, I did a few full contact fights and and, and was very successful in tournaments um, and one year we had the opportunity, in 1991, we had the opportunity to go to Japan for the World Koshiki Karate Championships. Uh, Koshiki is like full contact uh, point fighting, where you wear gear, kind of like Bogu. And um, there was maybe 23 countries there that got to fight, and I was fortunate enough to win that, that tournament. Um, I was also still practicing my Kobodo uh, along with uh, fighting and I was fortunate enough to win that division as well. I continued to compete a, a little bit um, you know local tournaments and, and some nationals and I, I went to Scotland and, and won the gold medal there with Kobodo and, and Karate and Mexico same thing and oh I'm probably forgetting some uh, I don't really um, pay much attention to uh, competition Karate anymore. Yamashita Tadashi Sensei was a student of Shigeru Nakazato in Karate and also a student of Matayoshi Shimpo Sensei in Kobodo. So pretty much from the get-go I started training the Matayoshi uh, lineage Kobodo and I ended up traveling to Okinawa. I got to meet you know Shigeru Sensei Nakazato and Matayoshi Shimpo Sensei and began training with them and I eventually became becoming a direct student of Nakazato Shiguro in, in Shoren, Shorenkan Karate. And also, I uh, was fortunate enough to spend about seven years with Matayoshi Shimpo Sensei, uh, you know, the founder of, of that association. Um, after Matayoshi Sensei passed away in 1997, he named his successor, and his name was Gakia Yoshiaki Sensei. And I had been training with him on trips uh, to Okinawa when I was still uh, training with Sensei Tadashi Yamashita. So we got to be uh, pretty pretty close and, and trained a lot together and um, after five years after uh, he, he took over for the Matayoshi Association he started his own association called the Okinawa Kobro Doshi Rensei Kai and I had just, uh, Sensei Yamashita and I had, had gone our separate ways and I had asked Gakia Sensei if he wanted me to be his first student. Uh, was, Gakia Sensei said yes, and he said someday I think people will understand why. But I, I continue now as the president of the Okinawa Kobro Doshi Rensei Kai because sadly, uh, 2011, uh, Gakia Sensei suffered a stroke and has been a unable to practice uh, since. So, you know, Kobro is the study of. Uh, Know, farming and fishing tools that the Okinawan people developed as ways of self-defense. The first tool I'll talk about is the, the kama, which is very common around the world. It's a sickle, and I think every culture has a version of it for 
cutting down trees and weeds and uh, pruning uh, and so on and so forth. And you've got a sharp blade with a handle and you, one can see how it could be easily concealed on your body and a very devastating weapon of, of self-defense. You know, there's blocking techniques, striking techniques, hey! uh, obviously cutting techniques, slashing techniques. Um, the, the Kama is, in, in our association, is, is not taught until oh, someone is, is fairly senior, uh, usually fifth on. You know, they're, they're dangerous. They're a sharp knife. So pretty much now training with the Kama, uh, the students in the dojo use uh, wooden blades. So they can, they can get the technique correctly but not have to pay big uh, when they make a mistake and have the, the angle wrong, you know, sticking it into their leg or somewhere else. So, um, you know, the Kama is a flashy weapon. Definitely a devastating weapon. Uh, I think uh, Okinawa call it irana. It's the uh, Uchinanguchi pronunciation. But English, it's a sickle. So the most common tool uh, is the six-foot staff. Okay, Rokushaku bow, or just most people just call it a bow. I think uh, some people call it a bow staff, and uh, that actually means they'd be saying like bow bow or staff staff. So you only need to say one or another. It was used for a lot of different things, carrying water pails, um, you know, maybe the end of a rake, a uh, shovel. And one of my teachers, uh, Yogi Jose Sensei, said that it was a, it was like a two by four. He said that was the height of the houses, and they were tied together with six foot sticks. So they were very easy to come by. I think that the uh, most people, most dojos, most associations, most senseis start their students with that, the bow. It's, you know, it's a good way to get yourself coordinated, get used to doing some, you know, something uh, graceful with you know, a weighted tool in your hand. And there are many, many uh, kata for the bow. Uh, it's without a doubt the most popular and most used Okinawan tool. The, the syllabus of the tools and the order in which we teach them. We, you know, start with the bow and then the next is the sai. The sai is the three-pronged trident. Then the next one is the tonkwa. Um, we call it tonkwa, most people say tomfa, also pronounced twifa and tufa. And the tonkwa was a, a mill handle. Uh, used, you can grab the handle and it's stuck inside a bowl and you, know, you can mash stuff up with it. So it's a very good weapon if you know karate because um, they just they fit in your hands and and you can you can do that karate with them. After the tonfo, we go right to the uh, the nunchuck, which is you know everyone knows what they're not called nunchucks they're called nunchaku, and you know two two sticks connected by a string. Um, lots of different ideas on the original use of that horse bridle or a horse bit. Um, Nice, Matyoshi sensei told me that it was the rope that was important in the middle that it was used for, that those were handles and you'd scrape the uh, bark off banana trees. Uh, who knows? But regardless, very popular, you know, popularized by the Bruce Lee movies and uh, easily concealed. Uh, one of my teachers said it's the, the, the least respected weapon because bandits would use them. So I don't know if he was half joking because of the Okinawa sense of humor, but I can definitely see that. Uh, after the nunchuck, we go to the bodor, or the ieku. And uh, uh, ieku was actually, by many people's account, in my own personal conversations with Mata Yoshi Shinpo Sensei, was his favorite tool. Um, and you can kind of see that if you uh, notice the number of times he's demonstrated at world tournaments and world conventions and Taikais and, and whatnot. Um, the particular kata that we do is called a Chiken Akachuno Eku Day, uh, which in English means Chiken the red faced person. Uh, so there's a fable about the about the uh, the origin that 650 years ago uh, this person Chiken got in some trouble, but the uh, the king didn't want to put him to death, so he exiled him to the island, now known as Tikan Island. And the Akachu part comes in, Aka, red, chew people. Uh, so Chikan, the red-faced guy, uh, his, his eco technique is, is ore. So in the 
ekukata, chicken akachino ekude, there's rowing techniques that work into blocks and counters and strikes, and there are throwing techniques. You figure if you got a boat or you're near the water or the sand. So there's, there's uh, sand throws, there's uh, kicking sand with the foot as you, as you do it. The connection to how you actually would use a boat oar is, is really what makes it special. It's a great part of the, uh, the Matayoshi lineage curriculum. And, um, you know, I think most of Sensei Matayoshi students would tell you that that was his favorite tool. So during my competition years, um, they had just started uh, uh, allowing you to do uh, Okinawa Kobro uh, at the tournaments. And so I would compete uh, in those tournaments with, with the various tools, the bow, the sai, the tumfa, the nunchuck, whichever one I decided I was going to do that week. And uh, I was standing next to a friend of mine, his name is Rick Rufus, and he had started kickboxing the same time as me, and I was getting ready to go do my kata, and he said, why are you doing that, you know? I said, I do the kobro because I don't plan on doing, uh, being a professional fighter. I, I want to do these fights so that I would be able to talk to my students. I want to be able to talk to my students about every aspect of the martial arts from experience, and and that's why I did those those fights. I knew it was going to be a very limited amount of time uh, to do that, but the, the kobro practice and, you know, the empty hand kata practice for karate, I could see that those are going to be something I could do you know, lifelong. In, in the United States, I was appointed by Sensei Tadashi Yamashita to be the head of his association for Kobodo because I had been traveling a lot with, with and without him to Okinawa and spending a lot of time with Matayoshi Sensei and, and Gakia Sensei and several of his other students. And he, he told everybody without telling me that I was going to be the head of his Kobodo association. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to Okinawa right now and I'm going to get this uh, guidelines and bylaws and syllabus and, and, and make sure that all the kata stuff is correct. So I did that. And like I say, fortunate enough to become close with Gakia Sensei. Uh, trained with him during that five year period that he was running the, the Kodokan, which is Matayoshi's dojo and association. And when he left, I went with him. Um, it was simple. You know, he said, my teacher died and um, you know, I want to carry on, but I want to, I want to do it my way. Once I was established officially as uh, Gakia Yoshiaki Sensei's student, um, he immediately asked me to come to Okinawa um, to kind of recertify my grade at the time. And I said, well, I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to go to Okinawa for anything. So uh, I went over to Okinawa and training with Gakia Sensei was uh, was life training. Although his Kobodo skills were like no other, uh, in incredible uh, physically, um, the speed, the balance, everything that you look for, um, he was he was the best at it. He was really something, and he was also extremely humble. His favorite word was wa. Uh, wa means harmony, and he would always talk about WA when he had you know, groups of people and, and uh, whenever I would call him and say we're having this gathering, would you like to send a message to the members? And he would just say, WA, you know, uh, harmony, everybody get along. Um, I learned that from him and I think it really changed my, my way of thinking and my, my personality. Gakia Sensei wouldn't ever criticize another style or another uh, association. Uh, he would, if I would ask him a question why this person does it differently, he'd say, I only know the reasons why I do it my way, uh, or the way I've learned it from Matayoshi Sensei. I understand that, you know, all the physical reasons why I do that, uh, and I'm sure that they have their reasons too. So um, when, you know, when I want to jump too fast to when he got ill, because I did, I was lucky, lucky to spend, you know, quite a few years with him. Um, I met him in uh, 1990 and got to see him throughout the 90s and the uh, uh, first part of the 21st century, those 10 years. And then the association started in 2011 and of 
course, we, we, get, we had almost 10 years uh, together there. I did some traveling. I had him you know, to the United States a few times for seminars. Um, and any time there was, a, was an issue, um, you know, Gakia Sensei and, and would never raise his voice. He'd never get mad. Um, he was just very, very calm. And, uh, you know, anybody who knew him loved to be around him. So immediately after uh, I heard the word that uh, Gakia Sensei had, had a stroke and was in the hospital, I took the first plane over to Okinawa and I went to visit him. And uh, he was you know, coherent. He had had, had surgery, and um, but he was he was real excited to see me at the hospital. Um, and of course, then we were all hopeful that he would recover uh, from the stroke. Uh, and as the news went on from the doctors that it was going to be a real long haul um, for him uh, health-wise, and you know they weren't sure about his recovery or, or what they could do. Um, you know, he started thinking and talking to me more about me taking over the association. And when I finally did, um, and the word went out, you know, a lot of foreign countries, students, or um, the senseis that were branch leaders um, in the association, they, they immediately quit. Um, didn't really understand, but I talked to Gakia Sensei. You know, I, I could talk to him about anything, and and he said, "Well, that's easy. Just teach who wants to learn." And I'm like, "Yeah, that makes pretty good sense." Um, so he said, "Don't worry about the ones that dropped out. Just teach who wants to learn." And uh, I think that's you know pretty pretty good philosophy and uh, pretty good advice to follow. So that's exactly what I'm doing. So the unfortunate situation uh, with Gakia Sensei's health, you know, has left me, um, you know, without a sensei. And even though I've trained 40 years, I still enjoy, you know, learning. And I realize that there's a lot of people in, in this world and in the martial arts that know way more than I do and are more experienced. And um, so I'll, I'll always look up to Gakia Sensei. I always try to remember. I promised him I'd keep his association going, and it's going very well. Um, I am fortunate enough that I've been to Okinawa enough times that I've, I've met other friends and established other relationships with Matayoshi Sensei's other students, uh, Ishiki Hayataro Sensei, uh, Yamashiro Kenichi Sensei, um, Yose, Jose Yogi Sensei. Um, I've met, met all these people you know, 30 years ago. And I've gotten to know them over the years, so it's 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 a little bit of a consolation that I'm able to still, you know, come to Okinawa and, and get together with guys and train. And in my later teenage years and my entire adult life, studying, practicing karate and kobudo, I I've had so much fun and met so many wonderful people. Uh, what one of my favorite th things about uh, being a karate teacher and, and owning a dojo is watching how it changes people. Um, sometimes people come in and, you know, they might be a little standoffish, they might be uh, a little shy, they might be lots of things, and karate opens them up. Uh, karate is really about training your heart.